right? We've seen already the panders, we've now seen the seducers, and now we'll get on to the flatters, right? The final one of this book, of this canto. Now, he said, we, uh, we're told, we could hear the sounds of people's screams from the next boss's pocket, and the noise made by their puffing snouts, again, like pigs, and by their palms as they struck themselves. This hitting of yourself, by the way, is a reoccurring motif in the Inferno, especially the further down you go. The banks were caked with mold that clings there, formed by an exulsion that steams from down below, offensive to behold and to inhale. The bottom is so far down that we could nowhere see it until we scale the rich's high point at the arch's crown. When we reached it, I saw deep down in the foss people immersed in filth that seemed to drain from human privies. Poop. Human poop. These people are stuck in human poop. Searching it with my eyes, I saw one there whose head was so befouled with shit. This is the actual translation out of the Italian. And the word gets used simply because that's what it is. Please forgive the translator here. You couldn't tell which one he was, layman or cleric. Note the dark irony. Dante's always making his jabs at the church, right? And we'll have something to say about this at the end of our lecture. They are stuck in a pool of human shite. And they're shoved down into it by the demons. And when they come up for air, they open their mouths and it goes inside and then back down they go again. This is how they spend their eternity. Why? Well, it's an interesting question. Is there any real necessary equivalent between telling a lie and the stuff that bulls will drop out their back end? The S. Technically, there isn't until Dante writes it. This may be one of Dante's most disturbing and ingenious, we would say, creations. In your life, think about it. In your life, if you spit poop, so you're standing there with all your friends and the person walks up. You go, hi, you're looking very nice today. And then as soon as she walks away, you turn to your friends and you go, can you believe what she had on? What was that about? In other words, you speak poop in life. In the afterlife for Dante, you swallow poop. Flatterers. People who say things they don't really mean. Whoa. Notice interestingly, we're back to language again. Dante is very much as a poet about the words that get spoken and the words that get received. Looking at me now, this man howled. Again, Allen Ginsberg loved this poem, and he, his most famous poem is called How. He howled. And why are you so greedy to look at me when all of these are just as filthy? Why are you singling me out? Every, all of us have this disgusting stuff that we're dealing with. I called. Because if memory serves me properly, I saw you once when your hair was dry. Dante's irony is dark here, right? This is some comedy. I don't know how comic it is. He goes, oh yeah, I think I recognized you before you had poop all over you and your hair was dry. <laughs> I know. I know who you are, he says. You're Alesso Intomini, right, of Luca. We don't know very much about this guy, by the way. This is his one claim to fame, that he ends up in a river of poop in the middle of Bolgia 8, uh, in, in Circle 8, right? Dis disturbing on every count. Which is why I eye you more than all the rest. And then he, beating his head. Again, we're back to this thing of self-mutilation. Down here, he says it, is where my flatteries that store with which my tongue seem never to be cloyed have sunk me. In other words, yeah, this is what happens to you. If you end up flattering all the time in life and lying and deceiving in this way with your language, this is where you end up. Of course, marry this against Machiavelli's Prince when we studied that. And you'll remember that Machiavelli said the great leaders are the ones who know how to lie the best, the ones who know how to flatter, the ones who know how to use their words in deviant ways. Then, to finish now this, this canto, my leader gave me advice. Extend your gaze a little further ahead so that your eyes may fully observe the face of that disheveled strumpet, a woman, a prostitute, who in the mire scratches her body, again we're back to the self-mutilation thing, as she stands or squats with shit-rimmed fingers, so she's got the poop underneath her fingernails. She is Theus, the whore, who asked, and is my favorite, and, and is my favor with you great? Replied, enormous, to her paramour. 
Let our sight be satisfied with that. There's some interesting stuff going on here, by the way. Uh, this is a character actually from a play by Terence called Eunicus. And the only way scholars think that Dante could have known about this is through Cicero, through a text of his. The source is provided, by the way, in, the, uh, in, in uh, your notes at the back of your volume. And it's probably clear that Dante's actually misquoting this very line. These lines actually are not attributed to, um, to the prostitute Phaeus. But notice here the power. And notice, we just said a few seconds ago, not very many women get to talk in Inferno. And now all of a sudden here we've got one. And we're told that the one thing she said was to her lover, uh, when her lover said, is my, is, is my favor great with you? She said enormous. In other words, she lied. She told him an untruth. By the way, let's just point out how that's the case, that our panders, our seducers, and our flatterers all use language to deceive, i.e. fraud. And again, we call this simple fraud because it's usually just a one-on-one -on -one thing, where in other words, your actions are specific to a single person as opposed to a group of people. We'll get to them in circle nine. Okay, let's work levels two and three, level two and three really quickly. At 2A, well, think about this one. Hurting others, this is the message obviously of this canto, hurting others, especially those who are innocent, will get you jacked way worse in hell than some of those people who are earlier and up above. Think about that one. Jason, for example, ends up here, right? Interesting. Why? Uh, we'll ask maybe why, why, does, why does an Aeneas end up there? Saying, notice another message, saying others are just as bad does not give you some kind of out. You don't get out of hell for Dante just because other people engage in the activities. Oh, I'm not as bad as, right? Finally, notice those in hell, notice this, never want to take responsibility for their actions. They always want to blame somebody else. And that, of course, is foundational to what it means to be in hell. The symbolism here is obvious. <laughs> I mean, Right? BS will never be said by you the same way after you've read this canto. Uh, you know, it's compelling, right? This, this uh, canto uh, 18. The ironies we've already pointed out. Notice, Jason is jacked. Dido is jacked. Aeneas, he gets to have a nice time in limbo. Fascinating. What's that about? Well, the easy answer, of course, is Dante has Virgil as his guide. Obviously, you can't have Virgil's hero in any part of hell, right? We said that we want to look at Dante as poet. I mean, let's just say it out loud. It's one of the most compelling word pictures ever. We say BS, but now for the rest of our lives, when we say the word BS, we'll have a word picture that goes with it, and we'll be like, man, I'm not so sure I'm going to use that, that word anymore. Obviously, it makes us think again about the ways we use language to manipulate people and maybe to harm ourselves uh, along the way. Dante is politician. Well, without question, Dante is making the observation, this time again about the Bolognese, that... You know, this is our problem right now, Dante is saying politically, is that we have people who will say anything and do anything. And again, he mentions Boniface, obviously the eighth, as being somebody. Uh, he wants to make more money. What's he do with his first jubilee in 1300? He brings everybody in and says, I'll give absolution to anybody that shows up, no matter what you've done. Fascinating. Finally, Dante will ask his philosopher. Well, these are this is a very interesting question. Notice... It's the power of language. I mean, in the 20th century, it'll be Wittgenstein, the great philosopher of language, that will play the same game along with Bertrand Russell. Yeah, he, will, he will say something as well as Noam Chomsky about the power of language and the way that language gets manipulated to, to obviously, great disadvantage and creating lots of negative energy. I mean, we're obviously going to ask this in 3B about the ways in which language by you and others in your life has often created some real negative energy. At 3A... Well, I mean, we can think about already from our studies that we started with. Think about, for example, the whole panders of, uh, of literature. The, the very word comes from, of course, Chaucer's panders, as we've said before in earlier lectures with, a, with, with his uh, Trellis and Crusade. Uh, that idea that you have that middleman who's the one who's kind of, you know, creating the negative energy or whatever. Think about even when we meet, for example, Shakespeare's Othello and the way he's ruined by Iago, who is a villain, but he plays that game as well, right? The seducers of literature, well, the one that comes to mind immediately is Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost. We'll get to him later. The flatterers of literature, well, go back to the Iliad. Do you remember every time that Hector calls out Paris? Remember what he always says, oh, you're so right, you're, my, you're the great warrior. But you have a tendency, probably Paris behind his back is saying something quite different, right? At 3B, you can pick this one off, you can 
for predict this one right. When was a time that you were flattered and you knew it? That is to say, you could tell. When was a time you flattered somebody and now you read this and you're kind of like, ooh, that's, that's probably not the best of things for me to have done. What's the time you use language to create lots of negative energy? And think about the ways in which lying and truth-telling um, are, are linguistically such an important part of what it means to live in a community. And of course, as Plato pointed out, sometimes when we lie, the worst lies are the ones that we tell ourselves. Some have argued all lies that you tell another begin first with self-lying. Right? The unexamined life is not worth living, is what Socrates said, remember, in Plato's Apology. Do you think, by the way, though, question, do you think it's fair to put people who flattered in hell, A, and in B, such a horrific kind of torture? I mean, this is without question the worst of the punishments, many students have said. Way worse than the fire, way worse than that. I mean, it is this, this is disgusting. Do you think this is fair? And why do you think Dante, a poet, who plays with language so much is going to so quickly have this as his punishment. Yeah. Well, now we're on to Canto 19 and uh, Bolger number 3, the Simoniacs. Now, who are these guys? Well, these are the guys who sell and buy ecclesiastical offices, indulgences. We already mentioned Boniface VIII. Guess what? We're going to hear about him again, and it's going to be in a most creative way that Boniface VIII will finally actually be mentioned. Dante's been gesturing towards him, but never actually identified him by name, and we're going to get there finally in Canto 19, and his critique of the church. Yes, Dante is a Catholic. Yes, Dante is a very arch, strong, conservative Catholic, and yet Dante is going to be critiquing the church. Think about your dates. Chaucer is born in 1343 and dies 1400. Luther nails his 95 lead theses up in 1517. I just think about that, right? The power of the idea of how an idea can be born maybe here in the Inferno and the critique of the church will be coming. Of course, the protest movement or the Protestant movement of Lutherism will be coming, obviously, in a couple of hundred years. It's fascinating how ideas connect with ideas. Thank you. I hope you're enjoying this study.